Stanford University. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see you all here this evening. I wondered this morning when the storm was raging what it would do to our attendance tonight. Um, I would say from my point of view as a former Northeasterner, there was only one thing wrong today with this storm, and that is that it just produced rain. I kept looking out, waiting for the snow to fall, uh, and it just didn't happen. But uh, we're glad to see you all here uh, tonight. Uh, so we have, um, in our continuing uh, evolution of information, I think a very, very important topic uh, this evening, uh, and this is going to be delivered by Dr. Ricardo Dol Dolmich. Um, he, uh, as I remember, came from Colombia, born in Colombia, Mike got that right, and uh, spent his time also in the Northeast, initially getting his education. He went to Brown University and then came to Stanford to do his PhD in neuroscience and then flip back to Boston, to Harvard to do a postdoc, and we were fortunate enough to recruit him back here in 2003. And he has had really quite a remarkable career, even at a relatively early stage of his own development, with a large degree of awards and acknowledgments for research that is really cutting edge. And one of the uh, best exemplars of that is that he is one of 81 scientists in the United States to be the recipient of what's called an NIH Pioneer Award. Now, just to give you a little context for this, the NIH is the major source of funding for biomedical research in the United States, and it's one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. has done so well uh, in biosciences over the decades. Uh, but most of the research that the NIH funds, just as is often the case, is based upon, if you will, pre-existing data. Um, so you have to actually have done some of the work as you're applying for the grant to get uh, the results. And that can lead to a certain degree of constraint and cautiousness and thinking out of the box. Uh, and so some years ago, in fact five, uh, the NIH decided to do something really important and I, I must say quite different, having uh, been a scientist at the NIH for 23 years before I came here. Um, I know that institution quite well, and this was, I think, a real step forward. And it's a big award. The NIH Pioneer Award is a two and a half million dollar over five uh, years award. And it's focused on uh, individuals who they believe uh, are really going to do cutting edge research. It is highly, highly competitive. Uh, and getting an NIH Pioneer Award is a badge of honor. Now, I will brag a little bit and say that in addition to Ricardo, um, Stanford is distinguished in having 15 of these 81 awards. So between the School of Medicine and engineering primarily, think about that for a moment. There are 131 medical schools in the United States, um, and each are competing uh, for these, and anyone would be privileged, if there are only 81, to have one. Um, but here we have 15, and I think that speaks a lot um, to the environment uh, that is, I think, yielding uh, the faculty who are uh, making great discoveries and who are speaking with you as part uh, of this course. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do uh, as we began to drill down, and over, as you'll see, um, for uh, the winter and spring semester, if you decide to re-enlist uh, for continuing in that uh, wonderful uh, venue, um, uh, we're trying to focus on concepts that are also of real practical importance. And the fact that Ricardo has decided to focus his presentation tonight on the brain on a specific problem uh, that is particularly topical these days, autism, I think is a very important opportunity to learn not only about broad concepts, but how they might be applied to individual problems. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Ricardo Dolmich. Well, thank you all for, for being here. I, I was also a little bit worried that I was going to be talking to, you know, four people. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see that we have a good, a good show. Um, okay, so my, my goal in this lecture is to give you uh, an overview of the nervous system and tell you a little bit about some of the organizing concepts that uh, 
have helped us to understand how the brain works. But I am not going to do this in a, I guess I'm going to do this in a very practical way and in a way that as you'll see in a moment is personally very important for me and I'm going to uh, do this through uh, the lens of autism, uh, which is a, as many of you probably know, it's a devastating uh, neurodevelopmental disorder that now affects somewhere between uh, one in 150 and one in 100 children. Uh, if any of you have children in the Palo Alto School District, you will almost certainly know a few kids with autism. So, um, so let me just start by uh, telling you a little bit about why I am interested in autism uh, as a sort of way of motivating um, the, the rest of the talk. So, okay, so uh, this is a picture of my two kids. And uh, from just looking at them, you would never guess that I have the worst genes in the world. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> and uh, I say that because um, Rio here uh, is little, but he has uh, type 1 diabetes. And Max has, uh, has a kind of high functioning autism called Asperger syndrome. And uh, today I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, why I work on autism and how having Max really changed the direction of my research. And in doing that, I, I hope to be able to tell you a little bit about how the brain works. Um, so let me just start sort of with the story of, of, of how it was that we came to discover that Max had autism. So, you know, Max was our, our first child. We moved here from, from Boston where uh, I had been at, at Harvard. And, um, you know, we had this, this child that didn't sleep, uh, had to be, you know, rocked continuously to get him to take a nap. We had to warm the bed. Um, and as he grew a little bit older, he was not hugely interested in us. He was very interested in spinning objects. Um, and now you see, he was our first kid, and so we kind of assumed that this was the way kids were. We wondered how people managed to have more than one kid. Um, <laughs> you know, and um, so, and, uh, you know, then after a little while, and I should say it took us perhaps longer than it would have taken other people, uh, we started getting worried when he didn't start talking. And uh, now it took us a little bit longer than normal because you have to understand I'm a scientist. I hang out with a lot of scientists. And so being a little bit odd is sort of par for the course. Uh, you know, so, um, so we started, uh, you know, trying to, we, we, you know, we took Max to a bunch of places and ultimately, uh, he, he developed, you know, we, we, he got a diagnosis initially, uh, you know, when, when he was very little, it wasn't exactly clear what was wrong. Uh, as he learned how to talk, um, he was given the diagnosis of sort of high functioning autism, which means that he, his IQ is, is fine, but as I'll tell you in a second, he has some disabilities. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we spent the last few years uh, trying to understand what we can do for him and also trying to, to understand uh, sort of the underlying biological basis of this disorder. Um, so let me, before I go further, let me tell you a little bit about, about autism. And really, we owe the, the definition uh, or the name of autism to these two gentlemen, uh, Leo Kanner and uh, Hans Asperger. And in the 1940s, there were uh, two Austrian child psychiatrists. I, interestingly, even though they were contemporaries, they wrote on the same subject, they never cited each other, and they never talked to each other. Uh, and uh, so, so Leo Kanner uh, was a, psych a psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, and Hans Asperger was in, was in Vienna. And um, in 1943, Kanner published a paper in a journal called Nervous Child, now, they don't name journals like this anymore. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, being nervous is no longer seen as a problem. Uh, uh, and uh, in this, in this uh, article, he described his visit to, um, he described actually five patients, but one of them was uh, a patient that he had seen um, in the house of a friend of his that was uh, an engineer. And this was a child called Donald. And uh, for Donald, he described a set of symptoms that he came to uh, call autism. And so he wrote, you know, this Donald seems self-satisfied and has no apparent affection when petted. He seems to almost draw into his shell and live within himself. And uh, 
This defined one of the major areas of impairment in autistic children, which is sort of social impairment, a, a failure to interact properly with peers. Um, he also said uh, words to him had a literal and flexible meaning. He seemed unable to generalize. And this is also uh, relatively common, uh, sort of a difficulty with language, often sort of a, a literal adherence to, to language. And now you might think that this is, this is not a big deal, but actually it's entirely disabling. Because it turns out that if you take language literally, you misunderstand almost everything. So, uh, so this was a, a, a second feature. And then finally he said, you know, he, he wandered around making stereotype movements with his fingers. He spun with great pleasure anything he could seize upon to spin. And so these sort of stereotyped uh, uh, and repetitive behaviors and interests are sort of the third uh, defining feature of autism. So autism, like almost all psychiatric diseases then, is sort of defined by a set of behaviors. And uh, we've now come to understand that there are you know, at least three related but relatively independent syndromes. One of, so autism sort of sits at the intersection of all three. There's Asperger's syndrome, which typically involves social impairment and restricted interests and compulsivity. Uh, and uh, there is something called pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which is you know, not hugely descriptive, but uh, it describes the overlap between restricted interest and compulsivity and communication impairment. Um, so, so one of the things we've learned since the time of, of Asperger and Kanner is that autism is like, in fact, like most common diseases, and certainly like most psychiatric diseases, is not a single disease. Uh, it's a, a spectrum of disorders, which is why people talk about autism spectrum disorders. And um, they, they share these three common areas, um, but very likely they are you know, separate, uh, separate sort of disease entry, uh, entities and have uh, separate, different causations. And I, I just thought I would just uh, give you an example of sort of two extremes. Um, and uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of videos. The first one is a video of uh, the man who is probably the most famous autistic uh, individual in the United States. He was the model for Rain Man. Uh, and he's a man called Kim Peek. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Fran took Dustin Hoffman's advice to share Kim with the world. The once introverted Kim has now appeared in front of more than two million people, all eager to test his genius with obscure questions. Who was the game-winning pitcher of Game 3 in the 1926 World Series? The, the Cardinals won it with Grover Cleveland Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> Seven hundred and fourteen. <laughs> All right, thank you. Who were the four people on the George Washington cabinet? Jefferson, Knox, Hamilton, and Randolph. There you go. <laughs> Along with these displays of extraordinary ability, the peaks preach a message about disability. You don't have to be handicapped to be different. Everybody is different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Here we go. Kim's gifts come at a price. No, we have to go. Kim, 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 we, no, on this side. Kim, we, Kim, we, Kim, we have. They're trying to keep you on the camera, and you've got to be over here to be on camera. I have to be on camera on either right side. Here. Right here. Yes. Okay. Are you calm oh, down. Yes, now? I told you. Either side. Okay. Here they go. Like all savants, Kim is an acutely different man. <laughs> Sometimes understanding Kim can be a challenge. Uh, I do it. I, 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 I can't do it. That's what I'm doing. Now you're starting. Now you know it. Yeah. Fran's patience is phenomenal. Now you get it. Well, yeah. Okay, so, so that's sort of one extreme. And there are a very small number, but there are some autistic savants. And I think many uh, high-functioning autistic uh, individuals actually have unusual talents. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, they are, you know, they're, they're sort of at the, 
at, at the border between being sort of functional and non-functional in some areas. So they have often really great memories, incredible powers of concentration, but unfortunately these come at the price of not being able to communicate. Um, but it turns out that the vast majority of autistic children are not like that, and uh, this I think is more representative, and I will give you just another example just to show you the diversity. Um, and this is from a video from Autism. <laughs> You can't really take a day off of autism. Autism never took a day off on me. She always has to have crying. my attention, and it's, it's exhausting. He doesn't speak much at all. Hi, hi. He has never spoken a single word. Everything about Daniel's life that seems normal for a typical kid, like going out to dinner or, or going to a park, all that for us is work. Oh, good. A little bit more. I'm almost done. Almost done. I so hope I won't be changing diapers when he's six and a half. I didn't choose to do this. I'm not a therapist. I was drafted. I have an autistic child. Everything I do is is about autism. I have to stay home with him. Okay, so you see then that you know there there uh, you know it's a, it's a huge diversity uh, in behaviors, and in fact it's a uh, it's a, it's a series of diseases. So um, I just kind of uh, feel that I should tell you a little bit about uh, the sort of theories that people have had about autism before I actually get into sort of the underlying neurobiology. And I'm going to do this by just showing you um, what uh, is, has been in the news recently about the increased prevalence of autism. Um, so what you see here is the number of, uh, 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 the number of children diagnosed with autism per uh, 10,000 births. And uh, you know, it was actually a very rare disease at the time of uh, Asperger and Kanner. And it was even quite rare until the 1980s, but over the last couple of decades, it has climbed dramatically. And the most recent uh, survey by the CDC uh, suggests that it's about one in 100 children, about one in 58 boys, which is staggeringly high. Now, the truth is we don't really know why. Uh, and maybe at the end, uh, if uh, any of you would like, I, I can speculate as to you know some of the possibilities. Um, but you know, there is, as you probably know, a lot of controversy as to whether this arises because there has been an increase in diagnosis or because there has been uh, some sort of underlying biological change. And I will give you my opinion later. But I just simply wanted to tell you a little bit about sort of the, the theories for uh, autism. And, um, you know, so for a very long time, you know, really from the 40s all the way to the 70s, you know, the standard idea was that uh, autism was actually caused by mothers. It was, the, the hypothesis was that they were refrigerator mothers, they were cold, and therefore the kids were weird. And um, this, uh, how shall I put it, it, it was not hugely successful in terms of treating anybody, but it certainly made a lot of people feel bad. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this, in fact, was, was, was the view. Um, and until in 1976, uh, what, is, what was really a pivotal paper was published in which a group of English investigators looked at the prevalence of autism in twins. And uh, what, they, what they found was that uh, uh, they, so they looked at identical twins so-called monozygotic twins, so twins that come from the same egg, and then they looked at twins that were dizygotic, so these were fraternal twins, which were sort of like siblings, right? And uh, what they found was that what they call the penetrance, that is to say the concordance, the chances that one twin will have autism if the other one has autism, uh, was somewhere between 60 and 90% if the twins were monozygotic, uh, but only about 6% of the twins were dizygotic, that is to say if they came from separate eggs. Now, the reason that this was really interesting is because uh, identical twins are identical. They're not really identical, but they're sort of identical. And they're sort of identical because they share all of their genes. 
right? They came from the same egg, and the same egg split and gave rise to two children, right? Whereas, of course, dizygotic uh, twins shared the same mother, they shared the same uterus, they had the same maternal environment, very likely they had the same uh, household and the same rearing environment, but they actually came from two eggs. And so this difference uh, told us really two things. The first is that it told us that, in fact, uh, the whole hypothesis that this was due to cold mothers was not very plausible. Not that I think it was ever very plausible. Um, but, uh, and uh, it, it told us that there was probably an important genetic component. Uh, the other thing it told us is that it was likely not caused by just a single mutation in a single gene. And let me tell you why. So, okay, so when you have, when you have monozygotic twins, that is to say when two children share all the genes, uh, the concordance is between 60 and 90%. So it's probably not 100% because uh, they're, well, it's, it's probably not 100% simply because the diagnosis of autism, like the diagnosis of most psychiatric diseases, is, is a little bit fluffy. And so, you know, there were probably some children there that were, you know, that had a different kind of autism. Um, but, uh, but the thing that's really interesting is not this number, but this number, which is 6%. Now, of course, you share, we all share, half of our genes with our siblings, right? So if it had been a single gene, right, then the prediction would have been that this would be 50%, right? And in fact, it isn't, it's more like 6%. And so what that tells us then is that it's not a single gene, it's probably a whole bunch of different genes. And in this way, it's similar to most common diseases that are caused not by single mutations, but by the accumulation of mutations. And so this then, so once, once uh, it became clear that there was a genetic component to autism. Now, let me just say that when I say a genetic component, I mean exactly that. I don't mean that necessarily a set of mutations cause the disease. Uh, all I'm saying is that they predispose you to the disease. And there may well also be an environmental component, though I should say the environmental component is probably not huge, given the concordance between identical twins. Right. So if, if the environmental component were very large, then you would expect that siblings or uh, dizygotic twins would have a very high concordance as well. Okay, so, uh, so this gave rise then to uh, a whole series of studies where people started trying to look for the genes that were uh, important for that were important in conferring susceptibility to autism. And, and, and the standard approach is sort of illustrated here. This is a a gene microarray. Uh, you may have heard of this um, perhaps in one of the earlier lectures. And um, what it is, it's a very large set of, of uh, pieces of DNA that are complementary to uh, pieces of DNA in your genome. And uh, this is one way that you can interrogate somebody's genome because it turns out that we all have, even though uh, all of our genomes are very similar, that is to say we all share the same genetic material, we're also all a little bit different. And we're mostly different in really tiny ways. And we're different mostly uh, because we have little point mutations. There are little bases that are a little bit different. So we have the same genes, uh, but those point mutations seem to make a big difference. And this is why you know, I am different from uh, somebody else. Uh, okay, so in order to interrogate this, people started using these microarrays. And uh, in fact, this technology was actually developed here, uh, at least largely developed here at Stanford by Pat Brown and uh, by Lubert Stryer when he was uh, at uh, Affymetrix. And uh, this then led to the identification of not one, but a large number of susceptibility regions. So these are uh, all of the chromosomes. So there are, as you know, uh, all 24 chromosomes, and they're all here. And then uh, what you see is a whole bunch of green or little red spots. And all of these are areas that, uh, in which mutations are overrepresented in families with autism. Okay? And now, uh, so, so of course, this tells us that it's highly heritable. It also tells us that it's very likely that there are multiple, multiple genes involved, right? But there was something actually very peculiar, and I guess it's something that we should have expected. Uh, and the thing that was very, very strange is the fact that none of these mutations actually uh, segregates perfectly with the disease. Okay, so what does that really mean? Well, okay, so if you look at a family, right, they may have a, a child with autism, uh, and in fact, you may find that there is a particular mutation that only occurs in uh, families with autism, 
but it might be that in some of those families, it's also found in some people that don't have autism. So it means that those mutations are not penetrant. That is to say that they're not enough to give you the disease, right? And so this has led to this, this sort of model that I had over here. And, and actually, before I, I continue, I, I tell you about the model. It just me, let me just tell you about the kinds of changes that people have observed. So there are basically three kinds of, of uh, sort of differences that, uh, that essentially make us all individuals. So the first kind of difference are these single point mutations that I told you about. They're called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Right? And they are single base pair changes in the genome that uh, differentiate all of us. There are now most of the SNPs that we look at are actually really common ones. And the reason for that is that, um, uh, in fact, when people were just sequencing the human genome and they were looking for regions that they were in which they could distinguish different individuals, they looked for regions that were variable in, in everybody. Uh, and so, in fact, those variation at, at specific places in your genome is, is actually, in these specific SNPs, is actually very common. And actually, even more interesting than that, uh, it turns out that almost all of these little, that the variability in all of these little genes is, is actually a very, very ancient. And so we share that with you know, people in Africa and people in Norway. And so these are sort of common, common changes. There are also some rare mutations. And so these are ones that uh, are uh, where these are, these are parts of the genome where really there isn't a lot of variability for most people, but in a few people there, there is some sort of a genetic change. And then finally, there, is, uh, there are these deletions and duplications, and they're called copy number variations. And, and let me just explain this uh, to you for, for one second. So what, what is a copy number variation? Well, it turns out that our genomes are full of repeats. Uh, we have all these genes, right? And you, many of you may have heard that uh, our genes have you know, sort of coding regions, that is to say, the parts that, it, that code for proteins. Uh, but uh, we also have large parts of our genome that don't seem to encode anything. And it turns out that in many of those parts, there are pieces that seem to have been duplicated. And many of these uh, probably came into our genome through, through viruses. And so we have all these duplications all over the genome. And the interesting thing is that different people have different numbers of repeats. So some people have hundreds of repeats, and some people have you know, just one or two. And we didn't really know whether this was important or not. Uh, but it's turned out that uh, there are big differences in these copy number variants. And some of these differences in copy numbers uh, are actually associated with autism. So this has led to the following model then, which is sort of illustrated here. Um, and the idea then is that uh, there's sort of a balance that determines whether you're going to develop normally or not. There's, you know, you, you, we probably have some genes that confer protection. Uh, and then everybody has a large number of SNPs. And this is what is called the genetic background. All the things that make you you, that's your genetic background, right? And then superimposed on that are these copy number variants that probably arise, uh, and geneticists call this de novo, so they arise again uh, in an individual with autism. Uh, or there are these rare mutations. And so these uh, kind of tip a particular individual over the edge, but by themselves may not be enough to give you autism. And so this is the current model for the current genetic model based on what we found uh, from all these genome, genome studies. Um, OK, so, so great. So we, we, we now think then that this is a genetic uh, disease, at least partly a genetic disease. We have started to identify some of the genes that confer susceptibility. And um, you know when, they, when uh, people were pitching the sequencing of the human genome, um, they often made the argument that, well, you know, if we knew what mutations were associated with disease, we would be able to develop treatments. And that turned out to be true, but only sort of half true. And the reason that it's only half true is because, well, you can know what's mutated in somebody's genome, but unfortunately, that doesn't tell you what is wrong. Uh, because for the most part, we don't know what many of these genes actually do. And so the question then is, how do you go from these genes, which we know already give rise to proteins that are a little bit different, uh, and how do we go from this to a particular set of behaviors, right? And uh, so this is where I start. I'm going to start talking to you about neurobiology. So far, I've talk talked to you about psychiatry and genetics, but now this is going to be neurobiology. And the way this happens, of course, is that, is that genes 
gives rise to proteins, and those proteins then change the structure and function of cells in the brain. And, uh, and then those cells, in turn, change the function of specific circuits. And it is those circuits that ultimately result in behavior. Now, a lot of things are hidden in these arrows. right? So sometimes we don't really know exactly what the proteins do and how they would change the cells. And I'm going to spend quite a lot, a lot of time telling you about some of the approaches that uh, we are taking, as well as other people at Stanford, uh, to try and understand this question. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you actually go from cells to circuits and uh, how you can try and use the anatomy of the brain to give you some clues about how that may change behavior. Um, but I would say that the biggest question mark actually sits here. right? So we, at least conceptually, can understand how it is that cells can uh, give rise to circuits. But really trying to understand how it is that kind of squishy, wet, soft things like cells give rise to sort of gauzy, amorphous things like ideas and behaviors. This is something that uh, you know, we're far away from, from solving. So, OK, so, so what, what are the cells of the nervous system? Um, OK, so uh, all of you uh, may know that uh, the nervous system has a, a very large number of cells. And there are essentially three classes of cells. And in fact, we owe the idea that there are cells in the brain to the work of this man, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was a Spanish aristocrat who uh, decided that what he really wanted to do was to try and understand the underlying basis of uh, the function of the brain. Now, in Ramon y Cajal's day, and this was sort of at the end of uh, the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, the standard idea was that the brain actually didn't have cells. It was just one huge, continuous thing. And uh, so he set out to try and determine if this was really the case. And he, he borrowed a technique from his competitor, a man called Camilo Golgi, who had developed an approach for uh, staining just a small number of cells in the brain. And so to really understand why that was important, um, you have to understand that the brain is very, very densely packed with cells. And uh, in a little while, I'm going to show you a real human brain, and I will pass it around, and you will see that it is very densely packed with cells. And so the problem is that because it is so densely packed with cells, it's really difficult to figure out if, in fact, those cells are really separate cells or not. Uh, so, uh, so what they needed then was some way of staining some cells and not staining the other ones. And so this is what Ramon y Cajal actually did. So in fact, they borrowed techniques from uh, the development of photography using uh, sort of the reactivity of silver, uh, the precipitation of silver with light. And they generated, uh, he generated a whole bunch of uh, slices of brains of a wide variety of species uh, in which he could detect all these little lines. And by very, very carefully drawing them, he discovered that, in fact, they were not connected to each other. They came very close, but they did not actually connect. Um, and so this helped him define some of the major classes of uh, cells in the brain. And so there are really three major, well, there are four major classes of, brain, of, of cells in the brain. So one class of cells are the neurons, right? And this is a neuron. Uh, and so neurons are, in my opinion, gorgeous cells. They, they have uh, you know, sort of the cell body, and they have this huge network of these sort of hairs, which are called dendrites, and they have an axon. And I'll tell you in a little while, I'll tell you a little bit more about you know, the various bits of, of a neuron, because you're going to have to understand this if I'm, if I'm going to be, for me to explain to you uh, some of the hypotheses about the cellular basis of autism. Um, but, but for now, just, just this is sort of a prototypical neuron. This is, in fact, a neuron from a, a mouse in my lab. Um, and uh, and uh, in fact, you know, there are many different classes of neurons. So this, for example, is a Purkinje cell. And one of these is a, is a, a spiny interneuron. And uh, these are found in different parts of the brain. And they have some things in common. They have this ability to carry electrical signals. And they have this ability to communicate with each other. But they're also, as you can see, quite different. And they have sort of different shapes. And uh, I, I mean, I would say we still don't really understand how it is that these shapes arise. And we don't really understand why we need uh, so many different kinds of neurons. But we clearly have a large number of different kinds of neurons. Um, OK, so what do neurons do? They generate and they transmit electrical signals. So they're in the business of carrying these electrical signals from one 
region of your brain to the other. They, uh, they process information, so they're sort of the um, processing entity in your brain that uh, is important for integrating things, for, uh, for, for uh, storing information, and uh, for um, parsing out information in particular ways. Um, and then, of course, they activate the muscles and glands and all the other cells that kind of give you your output. Okay? So, so they, they essentially carry the information. But it turns out that they don't work by themselves. Um, oh, I, I, sorry, this was just my little example of electrical activity in neurons. This is just a video from, from our lab. I just wanted to show you that uh, neurons actually carry these electrical signals. And this is a set of neurons that has been uh, put on a glass cover slip. And they've been loaded with a particular chemical that reacts every time that the cell has been activated electrically. And so they turn from blue to green. And uh, in fact, this is a, an experiment that, that I did. This is, you know, when you, when you start as an assistant professor, you know, you don't have, you know, anybody working for you. So you actually do your own experiments. And so I, uh, I know, so I, I, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, one of my, my, my better ones. And so every time that the calcium goes up, Every time I stimulate, you'll see that the, that the cells turn green. Okay? So, so this is just to illustrate that these are cells that are electrically active. Okay, so okay, there's a second class of cells in the brain, and uh, these are called glial cells, and there are really two kinds of glial cells. Uh, there are astrocytes, and this up here is an image from a very interesting uh, genetically engineered mouse. Uh, in which these glial cells are actually uh, producing a protein from a jellyfish. Uh, in fact, they're producing different kinds, different colors of proteins from a jellyfish. And so these particular proteins are fluorescent proteins. So if you illuminate them with the right uh, frequency, the right wavelength of light, they uh, emit light. And so it turns out that in this particular mouse, and I won't go into the details of how it was made, but uh, sort of by accident, uh, they ended up staining these astrocytes in the brain. And you can see that astrocytes are quite different from neurons. So these things up here are neurons, but these things are astrocytes. And they're kind of long and big, and they uh, essentially fill all the spaces. And interestingly, even though they're very abundant, we don't really know what they do very well. We have some sort of general ideas. So we know, for example, that they're really important for modulating the, the activity of neurons so they can, for example, maintain the amounts of ions in the brain so that your brain doesn't do bad things. They're really important during strokes, for example, because they get activated and they uh, prevent the brain from um, getting further damaged. Uh, they also seem to play a really important role in maintaining and forming synapses. And so, for example, Ben Barris, who's a, a faculty member here at Stanford, has been actually one of the pioneers in trying to understand how it is that these astrocytes actually control the development of the brain and how they control the connections between neurons. Um, so that's the second class of brains. And so this here okay, is actually a, a movie. And in this, in this movie, it's not the neurons that are labeled. It's actually the astrocytes. And so one of the interesting discoveries of the last maybe decade or so is that uh, it isn't only the neurons that are, actually, that are actually processing these electrical signals. The astrocytes are also processing electrical signals. But as you can see, they look very different. right? You can see that they're kind of being activated in clumps. It looks sort of like lightning. And again, I would say that we don't really understand what this means. Uh, but uh, it, it does suggest that there is you know, sort of an extra element of processing in the brain that is uh, somehow uh, presumably important for brain function. Okay? So I hope you can all see this kind of flashing. That flashing is actually the change in this fluorescent dye every time one of these uh, astrocytes becomes electrically active. Um, okay, so the other kind of glial cell is a cell called an oligodendrocyte. And uh, oligodendrocytes are really important because they're actually the cells that provide the insulation in your brain. And so uh, the neurons right, have, have uh, as I told you before, these long processes. And in particular, they have these really long, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you through this in one second, but they have a long kind of output process called an axon. And you know, it turns out that some of these axons can be really long. So you will have, for example, some neurons that are sitting at the very top of your brain, and they're sending an axon that goes all the way down to the, you know, the bottom of your spinal cord. Okay, these are your motor neurons, for example. And, uh, and so because they are very long, they have to actually transmit this electrical signal. Now, 
I don't know if there are any electrical engineers here, but you know, when you try and transmit a signal through, uh, through a cable, uh, in fact, that signal gets weaker and weaker and weaker over time. And so neurons have developed this way of amplifying the signal as it goes along. Right? And uh, at the same time, they've also generated, uh, developed ways of preventing the sort of electrical signal from leaking out of the cell. And so this is what the oligodendrocytes do. They actually provide the insulation. And so they have, they wrap themselves around the processes of the neurons to generate these things called myelin sheaths. And in fact, uh, a number of diseases are caused by, for example, immune attacks on the myelin sheath. So for example, multiple sclerosis is an attack on these, myel on the, on these myelinating cells that ultimately leads to uh, the death of the neurons. So it is very important that the cells actually be insulated. Now, just parenthetically, it turns out that that's not the only evolutionary solution, right? So you have two options if you want to transmit things fast and far. You can either A, have uh, generate some sort of biological insulation, or B, you can make really big axons. And it turns out that squid have done just that. They have these giant axons. Now, giant axons are kind of inconvenient because you know, uh, well, you know, you don't, you, have, you don't want to have a gigantic brain, and we have a lot of neurons, so you don't really want to have huge neurons. But, but if you're a squid, it's just fine, you know, because, you know, you don't need that many neurons. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so, so those are all the good dendrocytes. Okay, and then there's a third class of, of cells in the brain, and these are microglia. Let me just go back one second here. Uh, and hopefully it won't start playing. Oh, I guess it'll start playing. Okay, so, so microglia are actually the uh, immune cells of the brain. And uh, this, is, this is actually a movie from, uh, uh, from, from a, a relatively recent paper in which people for the first time were actually looking at the activity of these microglia in the brain. And so uh, let's see if this happens. Uh, let's start it again. Okay. So, okay, so at some point you'll see a flash, hopefully, here. And at that point, you'll see everything start to move. Right? So these things here are the microglia. Right? They're these cells. They have all these little processes. But they're not really neurons. In fact, they're, they're the cleanup crew. They're there to get rid of all the bad stuff. And what the experimenter did in this particular experiment is he took a laser and he just he, and he, and he uh, made a hole in one of the blood vessels. And when he did that, uh, all the blood started coming in. This is what would happen to you, for example, if you, if you had a uh, if if uh, uh, you know if you had a sort of cerebrovascular accident or something, if you uh, you know, and uh, and so the microglia are there to uh, essentially try and plug the hole as quickly as possible. They move towards the vasculature. So these are the other cells in in, in your brain. Um, okay, so let me tell take you just through the function of a, of a neuron very quickly, um, and uh, okay, so first let me just tell you a little bit about the anatomy of of a neuron, right? So Neurons have you know, this thing here, which is the cell body, right? And uh, this has, is similar to the cell body of man, many other kinds of cells. So it has you know, a nucleus, and it has DNA, and it has uh, mitochondria, and that's how it makes, uh, how it makes energy. Uh, then it has all of these, these hairs. These are called dendrites, right? And then it has an axon. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that the dendrites and the axon are fundamentally different. And so the dendrites are actually the input side of the, of the neuron. Right? And so neurons are actually getting, getting information through connections to other cells and their dendrites. And then at the cell body, actually right after the cell body at a, at a, a region called the axon hillock, they are converting uh, all the inputs that they're getting from all the other cells into a decision as to whether they should actually produce an output. Right? And the output that they produce is an all or none response an all or none electrical response called an action potential. OK, now I have a feeling that I said that not very well and too quickly. So uh, if, uh, should I try it again? No. no, that's good? OK, good. No, 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 do it again. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, let's try it again. Okay. OK, so neurons have two sides. They have the input side. The input side are these dendrites. The dendrites make connections to other neurons. And uh, the input is, and I'll tell you a little bit about the input in a second, but for now you've just got to trust me that uh, the, the way the input works is that 
uh, the cell, each one of these processes, is actually kind of averaging all the inputs that it's getting from, from, its, from its neighbors. And the electrical signals that are generated by the input from the neighbors are actually going to travel down. But they're traveling down in this kind of passive mode. And they're being summed up over here in the cell body. And actually, they're really being summed up right uh, after the cell body in a region at the very beginning of the axon called the axon hillock. And at that specific point, right, if the total amount of input exceeds a particular threshold, then this neuron then fires an action potential. And the action potential is this all or none regenerative electrical signal that goes all the way to the end. And when it goes to the end, it then will cause release of a neurotransmitter. And I'll, I'll tell you about that in one second as well. OK, so that's how a neuron works. OK, so let me just tell you about the action potential, because it is really central to uh, the brain. Yes? In general, there's only one axon per neuron. Uh, there are either many different kinds of neurons, and there are some neurons actually that have an axon that can bifurcate at a particular point, but typically there's only one, uh, one that leaves the cell body. OK, so, um, okay so, so what is this action potential thing? Well, you know, the brain is, is in the business of, or neurons are in the business of carrying these electrical signals. Uh, but if they, because they are, they are these, these salt-filled tubes, if the electrical signal did not somehow get re regenerated every so often, then the signal would die away. And so uh, nature has developed, well, I guess evolution has evolved, uh, a, uh, a, a mechanism for preventing these electrical signals from dying away. And this mechanism is the action potential. And really, we owe uh, most of what we know about the action potential to the work of these two guys, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley. And together, they did a, a series of experiments on the squid giant axon. And they chose the squid giant axon because, well, it is giant. And uh, they wanted to make electrical measurements. And uh, this was before there were any nano anything. And so you had to actually put little cables inside uh, cells, and you can only do that if the cell is really gigantic. Plus, you know, they were at Cambridge, and being Englishmen, they like going to Italy, and this is where you got squid. You know, so uh, they went to, you know, they went and they caught some squid. They did some experiments in the summer, and then they spent the rest of the year thinking and calculating. <laughs> um, and so uh, what what they did is they um, they developed a model for how it is that this regenerative uh, electrical signal gets propagated. And, and this is a little illustration of uh, exactly how this, this works. So first, just focus on this. I'm just going to play a little movie here of exactly what happens. And so uh, you don't concentrate. So, so there's a kind of, right? So there's a signal, right, that travels all the way to the end. And there it uh, causes some release of some chemical entity that then allows the cell to activate the next cell. So how exactly does this work? Well. To really understand how an action potential works, you have to know something about uh, how it is that cells control the uh, electricity across their membrane. So every cell has uh, an electrical potential. Uh, and in fact, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, it was first discovered that if you applied an electrical signal to a, uh, to a living to a living system. In fact, some of the, the very first experiments with electricity were done with sort of living organisms. And it was discovered that they could generate these sort of electrical potentials. Um, and every cell has an electrical potential. And what is an electrical potential? Well, it's actually sort of a difference of charge between the outside and the inside of a cell. And so cells, as you probably know, are surrounded by these lipid membranes. So the lipid membranes here. Uh, are not permeant to things that are charged, and ions are charged. Okay, so what does that really mean? Well, it means that that uh, there are these these kind of salts out here, and so typically the salt that's out here is sodium, right? Uh, and uh, sodium, when you put it into water, so, uh, salt when you put it into water dissociates into sodium and chlorine, and sodium uh, is positively charged, and it sits at the other side of this membrane, right? This membrane is a lipid membrane. And at the other side, you have not sodium, but you have potassium. And the reason that you have different concentrations of one ion in on one side and another ion on the other side is that cells have 
these pumps that sit on the membrane. And their job is to make sure that there is a difference in the number of ions at either side of the membrane. So if you bear with me for one second, I'll tell you why you should care, OK? OK, so it turns out that this lipid membrane okay, is not permeant to ions. And the only way that ions can get across is through these proteins. Right? These are specialized proteins that sit at the membrane, and they're called ion channels. And they're called ion channels because scientists are not all that creative. And you know, they are these channels that carry ions. Uh, so, um, okay, so the ion channels are not, open, are not all open uh, at the same time. In fact, the ion channels have two really interesting properties. The first is that they like specific kinds of ions more than others. So there are potassium channels. And, and potassium channels uh, like potassium. They will carry potassium ions, but they will not carry sodium ions. And there are calcium channels, and they carry calcium, but not other things. And there are sodium channels, and they carry sodium and not other things. Okay. So at rest, it turns out that the membrane is not very permeant to anything. But if it's permeant to anything, it's permeant to potassium. And because there's a pump here that has been using energy from sugar from lunch to generate this electrical potential, uh, the potassium tends to flow out. And I won't go into the, the details of how this actually works, but it turns out that uh, because potassium is flowing out, uh, there is a net negative charge inside the cell. There are more positive charges on the outside than on the inside. And this is largely because there's more potassium on the inside than on the outside. So potassium wants to move out, right? So things like going from places from high concentrations to low concentrations, right? And uh, sodium can't come in, but because potassium is positively charged, it actually leaves a net negative charge on the inside of a cell of around 70 millivolts. Okay, so this is how the resting membrane potential is established. Okay, so when uh, when a cell is about to fire an action potential, the first thing that happens typically is that it somehow gets a signal from a neighboring cell, and that signal from the neighboring cell causes some of these other ion channels to become open. Say, for example a uh, sodium channel. right? And so when that happens, sodium, which is now at much higher concentrations outside of the cell than inside, right, rushes into the cell. Now, there are several different kinds of sodium channels. Some of them are activated by neighboring cells, and some of them are activated by actually the change in the voltage. The change in the charge across the membrane actually causes a change in the structure of this protein. And when that happens, uh, this, this ion channel gets activated. Sodium rushes in. And when it rushes in, it changes the uh, electrical potential. It opens more sodium channels. And then this leads to a change in the electrical potential uh, inside of the cell. And uh, so why doesn't the cell just continue, continue getting depolarized? Well, it gets depolarized uh, uh, to a certain point. But then it turns out that the sodium channels are very cleverly designed. And they're designed so that they don't open all the time. They open, and they very rapidly close. And this is called an activation. And really, without an activation, we would not be able to transmit any electrical signals. So these sodium channels open, then they close. So, so sodium rushes into the cell. right? It depolarizes the cell. When the sodium channels close, the potassium channels again take over. And as I told you before, because potassium is higher on the inside than on the outside, it tends to then push the electrical potential or the voltage down. And so. Uh, in this way, you generate this spike. Okay? And it turns out that these spikes are the currency of the brain. This is, this is how information is transferred. Every thought that you have, every feeling, every idea is just a bunch of spikes. A bunch of spikes in a really large number of cells. Now, of course, we don't know how those spikes actually you know, give rise to feelings and thoughts and ideas. But really, that's what it is. Okay? So, OK, so what happens then once these action potential actually travels down the axon to the neighboring cell? Well, at, when it gets to the very end of that axon, right? so it travels as this electrical impulse. And when it gets to the very end, it gets to this, this little structure called a terminal bouton that forms a connection with the neighbor. And that connection is called the synapse. And the synapse is possibly the most important part of the brain. And the reason it's really important is because even though the neurons carry the information, in fact, uh, a lot of how information is processed in the brain is determined not by the process of transporting the, this electrical signal, but by uh, the 
by, but by the strength of the connection between neurons. And so that probably sounded a little bit like gibberish to you. And so I, I, let me just explain to you how that is the case. OK, so let's just think about the simplest possible circuit, where you have just one neuron right, that receives input from some, something in the world, say light. Okay? And that neuron receives input from light, and it has to make you do something like, for example, blink. Or it has to make your irises uh, contract so that you, know, you don't let too much light into your retinas. Right? Well, how does that actually work? Well, uh, the first time that happens, that, that neuron uh, transfers the information to another neuron, which is a motor neuron, that then activates the muscle that then does whatever it is that you have to do. OK, um, okay so far, so good. Now let's say, for example, that uh, the strength of the light uh, starts. So let's say, for example, that uh, you uh, walk outside. So you're in this room, and the light it seems bright to you, right? Uh, but in fact, the light outside is about 100 times brighter. But you have to be able to see stuff outside, right? Okay. So the way that the nervous system deals with that is that it changes, the it changes the strength with which the input cell actually communicates with the output cell. So the, the, the tweaking of those connections is really how, how information is processed and is how information is stored. And that's why neurobiologists are so excited about synapses. Right? They, they, you, know, you go to any neurobiology department, and three quarters of the department works on synapses. Well, they work on synapses because there's this idea that they are where stuff happens. right? Um, OK, so synapses live typically on dendrites. And uh, there are at least two classes of synapses. There are excitatory synapses. Those are the synapses that cause cells to become more excited. And there are inhibitory synapses. And those are the, cells that ca the, the synapses that cause cells to become less excited. And the excitatory synapses live on these little spines here called synaptic spines. And again, neurobiologists really love studying these synaptic spines, partly because we don't understand how they're made and how they're regulated, but also because this is where all these synapses live. And so one thing you should notice is that there are thousands and thousands of spines. And that's because every neuron is getting you know, 10 or 20,000 connections from its neighbors. So we have the system that is very strongly connected. OK, so what does this actual synapse look like? Well, there are a couple of parts to it. Uh, there, are, there are two sides. There's the presynaptic side. That's the, that's the part that is going to actually communicate with the receptive cell. And then there's the postsynaptic side. And in the presynaptic side, there are these little vesicles. And the vesicles are full of chemicals. And those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitters are released every time an electrical signal travels all the way down to the bouton. And they're released into this little space here called the synaptic cleft. And when that happens, they, this, this chemical then binds to another protein on the other side that, for example, could be a sodium channel. And that will cause the postsynaptic cell to change its electrical potential and, uh, and then convey a signal. Uh, and then this over here is actually an electron micrograph of a synapse. And what you see here, all these little things, are these are the synaptic vesicles. And this, this dark stuff, this is called the synaptic density. And this is all the machinery that is required to make sure that when an electrical signal gets to the very end of the neuron, it actually uh, causes release of neurotransmitter. OK, so why do we care about neurotransmitters? Well, we care about neurotransmitters because uh, this is uh, the way in which information is transferred from one cell to the other. We also care about neurotransmitters because it turns out that they're very important targets for a whole bunch of neurological and psychiatric drugs. And so I would say essentially all the drugs that affect the brain in some way change either the uh, activity of a neurotransmitter or the response of the cell to the neurotransmitter. Right? And so there are a whole bunch of different neurotransmitters. So you may have heard of some of them, like things like dopamine, for example, uh, and uh, acetylcholine. In fact, the most, uh, the, the, the most common, the most um, prevalent neurotransmitter in the brain is glutamate. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter, and it's the way in which cells communicate with other cells and excite the other cells. OK, so that's the synapse. Uh, OK, so, so uh, I, I would be entirely remiss if I didn't spend at least one slide telling you uh, about at least one of the things that I work on. And so it turns out that that synapse, 
you know, so I told you about these ion channels, right, that are really important for generating the action potential. And, um, well, there are many different kinds of ion channels, but one kind of ion channel uh, is an ion channel that carries calcium. Now, you are all, of course, familiar with calcium. You have drunk your milk, and uh, you know that calcium is really important for bones and for teeth and all that good stuff. But, of course, calcium is really important uh, for the signaling of essentially every cell in uh, the nervous system. And the reason it's really important is because calcium actually rushes into the cell and allows that synaptic vesicle release to occur, right? So, okay, just ignore that for a second. Okay, so this is a synapse, right? This is the presynaptic side. This is the postsynaptic side. There are these calcium channels here, and the calcium channels are gated by that change in voltage. They can sense when the voltage across the membrane has changed, and when that happens, they let calcium into the cell, and that calcium then causes these uh, vesicles to fuse and allows transmission to occur across the synapse. And that is uh, the basis by which all transmission occurs in the brain. Um, I, I should just say, just parenthetically, that uh, because, of course, nature is not minimalist in any way, nature is extremely baroque, it's all about making things incredibly complicated. Um, it's kind of the opposite of physics, right? You know, the, uh, <laughs> So uh, there are, of course, not just one kind of calcium channel. There are many, many different kinds of calcium channels. And we're still trying to figure out why it is that the brain needs 10 or 12 different kinds of calcium channels. And we have all sorts of ideas, but I won't get into them. Um, OK, so okay, now let's get back to autism. OK, so uh, how do we figure out what a genetic mutation actually does to a cell? So I told you a little bit about neurons. I told you about all the different kinds of cells in the brain. I told you about action potentials and ion channels. And well, you know, the, the sort of thought is that uh, there must be something about the, there must be something about these mutations that is changing the way in which these cells either develop or it's changing the way uh, in which the cells actually act. So, so how do we deal with this? Um, well, there, there are two approaches. One possibility is you can make a mouse. OK, so, uh, so biologists, and neurobiologists in particular, uh, you know, have a problem. And the problem is that we study the brain. And you know, so, so you know, if you're, for example, a dermatologist, um, you, you have plenty of access to, uh, to the stuff that you study. right? You, know, you can take samples of people's skin, and that's OK. Um, but it turns out you can't take samples of people's brain. And uh, you can't really do experiments on people's brain very easily. Uh, and you know, they don't like it. So, <laughs> so, uh, so if you're a molecular and cellular neurobiologist, as I am, you need some sort of a model system. And so one approach that people have taken is to actually take these mutations that uh, occur in humans, that have been discovered in humans, and try and introduce them into mouse cells or, into, or, or genetically engineer a mouse. And so we and other people have engineered uh, mouse models of autism. Now, because the autism mutations were only discovered relatively recently, in fact, there aren't that many models. And in fact, uh, two of the models are actually, I mean, there are only three. Two of them were actually developed here at Stanford. So uh, I'm going to tell you about one model. Um, so this is a, a mouse model of autism that we generated. OK, this, and you'll see it in a second, you'll see that this mouse is a very peculiar mouse. OK, so, so normally mice are relatively calm, but this guy is not calm. This, this, this guy, as you'll see in a second, is, is, is very hyperactive. And it, it does one thing very well. It does flips. It's a kind of Cirque du Soleil mouse. And, uh, and so this, it, it turns out that this mouse actually has a point mutation in one of those calcium channels that, uh, is, that is one of the very, very rare mutations that is completely penetrant. It's a mutation that if you have it, it gives you autism. So there are very, very few of that. And clearly, that doesn't account for the vast majority of disease. And I'll tell you in a second how we're trying to deal with that. But you know, in biology, like in politics, like in eh, almost anything else, you know, it's kind of the art of the possible. And you know, it's you know, very difficult to study a mutation that doesn't actually give, you, give everybody the disease. So we went for something that was really strong. And it turns out that this calcium channel mutation is very strong. OK, so that's, that, that's our mouse. Now, the question is, what is wrong with the mouse? Oh, this it describes actually what the mutation is. So this is kind of a what we call a topographic map of that calcium channel, right? And it crosses the membrane a million times. 
right? This is the membrane here. Each one of these is a piece of protein, right? And uh, you can ignore most of it. The only thing that's kind of interesting is that there's this mutation that occurs in these kids that have this disease called Timothy syndrome, and all of them have autism, okay? And we know already that this does bad, bad things to this calcium channel. So remember how I told you that ion channels, when they open, they close, they close right away. They have like this intrinsic timer. So that's how the action potential is generated. That's how, it's limit, how it limits itself. It turns out that that's true for all ion channels. So it's also true for calcium, right? So calcium channels have to open, but they have to close right away. And the way we know that is because we are very fortunate in actually being able to measure the current through those calcium channels. So you see these little, squig these little lines here? Okay, so on this axis, we have current, and on this axis, we have time. And, when, and what we're doing here is we're actually stimulating the cell in such a way that we can actually see the activity of the channel. And the only thing I want you to notice is that the channel initially opens, this is in response to voltage, and then it starts closing. And this is in response to, you know, this is just the way the channel is designed. It closes, right? And this mutation is preventing it from closing. Okay, and that is, a, we think it's a bad thing, but we don't actually know why it's a bad thing. We just know that it's different, right? Okay, so, so, uh, so we, what we say is that it actually doesn't go into what we call the inactivated state. Okay, so uh, what does this actually do? Uh, I'm not going to tell you about all the things we've done to the mouse. I'm just gonna give you one example because I think it's particularly cool. It turns out that uh, during development, so when, when the brain, so, you know, autism is a neurodevelopmental disease, right? And, uh, what this means is that there's some sort of a mutation that is altering the way that these cells are establishing connections with each other, right? And one of the things that happens as cells are establishing connections is that, you know, all those dendrites that you saw, those beautiful dendrites that are forming connections to their neighbor, well, in fact, they're not forming connections randomly. They're forming connections to just some other neurons that they like and not neurons that they don't like. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I don't really know. Uh, they, form, they don't form connections randomly. They form certain circuits, most of which we don't really understand. What we do know is that they explore the world a lot, right? So this is sort of a teenage neuron here, okay? It's not, not frozen. This is kind of pre-tenure, right? And uh, it's exploring the world. See, you can see it's exploring the world, right? And just check out how those, those uh, dendrites are moving everywhere, but they haven't formed any connections yet, okay? And in fact, this is a very complicated process by which the dendrites extend and retract, okay? Well, it turns out that uh, we can make those kinds of movies. That, that's a movie of a neuron, by the way, developing on the, on the stage of a microscope for a few days. And, uh, and we can make uh, movies of, of neurons in either wild-type animals or in, in animals that have this uh, mutation that leads to autism. And surprisingly, the mutation that leads to autism, uh, you know, the neurons uh, don't explore the world quite as well. And in fact, they end up with these kind of puny, pathetic dendritic arbors. And in fact, we explored this further, and it turns out that they do extend, but they're just not a, as good at making connections with their neighbors, and so they actually then retract. And so what that means is that a neuron in the cortex, in the outside of the brain of, of, a, of one of these mice, is making connections to its neighbors, but it's not making connections to as many neighbors. In fact, it's making more connections, but it's making more local connections. And so we have this hypothesis that that might help to explain why it is that many autistic kids are really good at certain things, but they're not very good at integrating multiple modalities. So, you know, for example, my son is fantastic at certain kinds of math. Okay, he, he, incredible. I mean, as a little boy, he used to remember uh, all the license plates in, a car, in cars in the parking lot, which was a wonderful party trick, but odd. Um, and, um, but, but he has huge problems, for example, doing, uh, like, for example, word problems or, or things that require integration across multiple modalities. Now, we don't really know where that is, but one hypothesis is that, uh, in fact, they have sort of over over uh, integration of local information and a failure to extend these long connections. And that would be approximately consistent with the defect that we see in the cells. Now, the other interesting thing is that once we see a defect in the cell, we can then try and see if we can do something to reverse it. And I won't tell you, won't show you this, but we have you know, now then gone to see whether we can actually find some drugs that will re reverse this defect. Um, Okay, now there's, there's uh, another very interesting mouse model of autism at Stanford. This was uh, developed by Tom Sudhoff, who is a, a faculty member here. Uh, and he's actually been one of the pioneers in figuring out all this information uh, about uh, how, how it is that uh, the synapses work. And um, so he actually has 
cloned a lot of the, and, and identified a lot of the proteins that are uh, presynaptic that are important for this uh, vesicle release process. But kind of as a sideline, he also started working, uh, working on these molecules that are really important for the formation and function of these synapses. And uh, he worked on two particular ones. One is called norexin, and the other one's called neuroligin. And it turns out that uh, sort of when he was doing this, uh, one of these uh, large, expensive genetic studies identified a mutation in neuroligin, and so uh, that is associated with autism. And he made some mice that have uh, this mutation. And what he found is that it actually alters the function not of every synapse. It alters the function of just a small set of a specific class of synapses, the inhibitory synapses, the synapses that turn cells off. Okay. So, so that's, that's one approach. OK, so, um, okay so, so this is great, right? But I told you that you know, there are like you know, 15 Timothy patients in the world. I mean, not quite, but not many. And uh, you know, um, it's, it's a great way of getting insight. And we hope that it'll tell us a lot about autism, but it's not exactly what we want. And one problem, of course, is that there are many genes that that lead to autism, and it's really, really difficult to, to uh, replicate all of those mutations in a mouse. It's, for one thing, it's very expensive. So you know, every time you make a mouse, it's like $100,000. If you had to make you know, 20 mutations, forget it. I mean, there's, there's no pioneer award that would pay for that, right? So, uh, so we need to have some other approach. Now, the, the other problem, of course, is that, um, and this is subtle, but it turns out that, that, <laughs> that mice are not human. And, uh, now, now you laugh, but you know, in fact, it turns out that we've been really great at curing diseases in mice. So for example, if you've got multiple sclerosis, the thing to do is to be a mouse. Because we've cured multiple sclerosis in mice a bunch of times. Uh, you know, but we're not so good at, at treating people. And, and, and it turns out that I mean, part of the problem is that, in fact, we diverged from, from uh, rodents a long, long time ago. So you know, you know, we have, there's at least 60 million years between you know, your standard you know, Mickey Mouse and uh, you know, Ricardo Dolmich, right? And so, uh, so that, that means that there are lots of differences. And there are at least two classes of differences. I mean, one class of difference is simply that, of course, our brain is way larger. And in fact, it takes much, much longer to generate all those neurons in a human brain. Uh, and uh, and but the other problem is that the neurons themselves are different. So for example, here, this is a, a particular class of neuron from, from a rat. And you, know, you see that it fires in particular ways. But uh, you know, a neuron from a monkey is really different. Okay? So we really need to study human neurons. Um, but you know, as I told you, you can't just go up to you know, your average kid and ask for a brain biopsy. So what to do? Well, you know, we were stymied for a long time. But then uh, uh, we were sort of saved by what has really been a remarkable a remarkable discovery that only happened over the last couple of years. And, um, and this is this idea that you can, in fact, generate stem cells from adults, from, from children, but also from adults. And you can generate stem cells from the skin of an adult. Now, you know, if you had told me this a few years ago, I would have said science fiction. In fact, when I saw the paper published, I said science fiction, you know, because I, like most scientists, I'm skeptical and I you know, fundamentally believe that my fellow scientists are doing it wrong, right? And so, uh, and, but it turned out that this Japanese group uh, led by Shinya Yamanaka and, and a group in, in Michigan led by Jamie Thompson uh, actually had developed this method of uh, reprogramming skin cells to generate stem cells. Now, a stem cell, by definition, is a cell that can make any other cell in your body, right, including a neuron. Okay. Now, what I told you before is that we think that there's this genetic predisposition in kids with autism. And now, the genes in your skin are the same as the genes in your brain. Right? So uh, the idea then is to take these skin cells, reprogram them, and then make neurons, and then see if we can figure out what's wrong with the neurons. Okay? And I should tell you, this is, this is something that really has never been tried in psychiatry. You know, psychiatry has been all about just testing stuff but not really knowing what it was hitting. Right? And so, so this is sort of what we have been doing. Uh, so we harvest skin cells from patients. We reprogram them into pluripotent stem cells. We're going to convert them into neurons, and we're going to phenotype the neurons. And I'm going to go through this quickly, because I'm running out of time here. But we're, you know, we have these, these patients. In fact, we have a very healthy collaboration with the Autism Center and with the Genetics Clinic at Stanford. And so we are uh, always recruiting new classes of patients. So for example, we have patients that have uh, 
uh, deletions in 22Q13, these, about ha these kids develop schizophrenia half the time. We don't know why. Uh, you know, we have uh, you know, kids with Timothy syndrome. We have uh, kids with Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is a fascinating disorder. The kids are exactly the opposite of autistic. They're hyper-friendly. And, um, and they're, you know, they're sweet, wonderful kids. Uh, they're, but they're not really good at spatial tasks. They are often a little bit mentally retarded. Uh, and uh, we don't know why. Okay? So we would like to know what's wrong with their neurons and which neurons are affected. Um, OK, so then we can reprogram the skin cells into pluripotent stem cells. And uh, I'll go through this very quickly because this is, well, I mean, it's still amazing that this works because, you know, there's just some magic here. But you can put these viruses that contain these, these like, proteins. And you can take these things that are fibroblasts and convert them into stuff that looks like this. And this is not a fibroblast any longer. This is a pluripotent stem cell. And we know it's a pluripotent stem cell because if you do it from a mouse, you can actually make a new mouse. You can make a new mouse from the skin cell of an old mouse. This is incredible, right? And, um, and so uh, we are not, you know, we're not going to make people, but we do want to make cells from people. So, so that, that's, that's how we're doing it. So, OK, so then you have to make these things into neurons. And it turns out that nobody had done that either. So it's, it's been you know, a bit of a hard slog, but we can do that now. And so you can make, for example, these cells that, uh, and uh, just ignore most of these things, but these things here are actually neurons generated from a patient that uh, has you know, uh, schizophrenia, for example. You know, and, and we generate not just one class of neuron, we actually generate what is actually kind of a mini brain, a whole variety of neurons and glial cells and oligodendrocytes. And uh, again, uh, I think it'll give us this, this ability to finally study a human neuron. Um, okay, the final thing is, you know, how do you figure out what's wrong? And, uh, you know, there are lots of ways of trying to figure this out. Uh, you know, you can, for example, look for changes in gene expression and things like that, but I want to focus actually on a specific class of assays. So, you know, I told you that you can actually measure the electrical activity of the cell by looking at the calcium. So we can, for example, measure calcium signals in these neurons. And in some of these patients, we have hypotheses as to what might be wrong. Uh, and so we're trying to address those hypotheses. We can also measure the electrical activity of these cells. And you can see that these are now human neurons. And so we have multiple classes of neurons, and we can figure out if there are problems in the currents and if there are problems in the synapses. Uh, and uh, we can also do things like look at the spines. So you can see the spines here, and we can count them, and we can measure them, and we can figure out how it is that they're forming. Um, so then this gives us then this, this way of actually looking for uh, cellular phenotypes. OK, how much time do I have? I have about, uh, OK, OK. So, OK, so, uh, so I told you then uh, how we're going then from the genes and the proteins to the cells. Um, now the question then is how are we going to go from the cells to the behavior? And I have to say that you know uh, the future I hope is is bright, but you know we're still a ways of uh, from from actually being able to do that in a very efficient way. Um, you know we have to somehow figure out how it is that these cells give rise to circuits and try and understand these circuits. So in sort of the circuit part of my talk, uh, I will. Uh, try and make it relevant to autism, but I should point out that we don't really know what the circuits are. Uh, most of what we know about the circuits of the brain are really derived from, uh, well, are, are really based on the anatomy of the brain, okay? So, okay, so how do we go from defects in cells to defects in behavior? Well, you know, you have circuits, and you know, the human brain has about 100 billion neurons and about 100 trillion synapses, which is about 80 times the US budget deficit. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, so it's, 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 it's a lot, but you know, the budget deficit is catching up. Um, <laughs> and um, OK, so, so, so how do you, what do we know about the circuit? So, so let me just tell you a little bit about the anatomy of the brain, because I think it will be helpful. And, and for this, I'm going to both show you, and I actually brought a brain and a spinal cord with me uh, that I'm going to show you. And you can uh, welcome to come up and touch it later if you like. Uh, it's a little freaky, but you know. Um, <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm going to do both. One second here while I get some gloves. Uh. So you don't want to uh, you know, touch the brains with your hands because they have lots of formaldehyde. And uh, well, it's not very good for your skin. It doesn't leave your hands silky soft. Um, <laughs> 
OK, so this is here. OK, this is a human brain. Take it out here. How old was the person that came from? Uh, so, so this was, this was an adult. Um, I don't know exactly how old. Uh, they, they come from, the, uh, from the, the sort of tissue donation program. Um, typically, they are you know, in their you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, something like that. This is not a child. Um, OK, so okay, that's, that's one. I'll, t I'll go through it in one second. I just simply have a couple of other things here. Okay. Half a brain. So you know, a few years actually, when I was a, a grad student here, I um, I was the uh, I was a TA for the neuroanatomy course, and I, it was my job to go and get the brains before the class started, which meant that I didn't have a car, so I had to go and get it on my bike, which was <laughs> which was you know very suboptimal, and you know I, I was I was terrified, you know, because I would go around on my bike, which had this this thing on the back with these these buckets. And, you know, well, I mean, I'm Colombian, and I was just, you know, scared that the police was going to stop me. And uh, because how do you explain that, you know? Uh, OK, so OK, here we go. OK, and hopefully we have, OK, we have some meninges here and a spinal cord. We have a spinal, oh, no, we don't have, OK, here we go, spinal cord. Spinal cord. Oh, well, we have a piece of spinal cord that got uh, partially, partially cut. OK, so, okay, so uh, this is the meninges. So let me just start from the very beginning here. OK, so, so uh, the brain, right, so the brain is covered by a series of membranes. OK, and this is one of them. And this is a really, really tough membrane, actually. Um, and there are three of them. They're called the meninges. And maybe I should stand over here so you guys can hear me. Uh, OK, and the meninges uh, have this important role of protecting the brain from, uh, well, actually, what they do is that they uh, hold the fluid that your brain floats in. Uh, and uh, this is really important, because it turns out that your brain uh, and neurons in general are very, are, are, are very fragile. And so you know, if you run and you hit your head, uh, if your brain was in direct contact with your skull, that would be the end of you know, a large number of memories, uh, not to mention you know, your capacity to do a lot of things. Uh, so the solution has been to suspend the brain in uh, what is called cerebrospinal fluid, which is this liquid that surrounds the brain. And that's held together by this stuff, which is the meninges. Okay, so, so there are three of them. And uh, the outer one is called the dura, the middle one is called the arachnoid, and the internal one is called the pia. And uh, you have probably all heard of meningitis, and meningitis is an infection, uh, is a swelling of the meninges, and it's potentially you know, life-threatening. OK, so now I'm going to just take you through first the bits of the brain. And uh, ooh, it's going to be bad for my pointer. OK, well, I'll try not to do this. I will just kind of show you. OK, so. OK, so let's just start from the very beginning here. OK, so this thing, this thing here, right? So this is the cerebrum, right? Uh, the brain has two hemispheres, right? There's a left one and a right one. And you see this little thing back here, right? That's called the cerebellum, OK? And, it's, and it means literally mini brain, OK? And uh, if you look at the brain from the top, you can see that there is uh, something called the central fissure, right, that divides the two hemispheres. And if you, uh, and now we tend to uh, subdivide the brain into things we call lobes. And the reason we do that, and I should say that there are a very, very large number of names for everything in the brain, which is one reason why medical students don't always like neuroanatomy, though, though it's getting better. Um, uh, and uh, so there are, we divide the brain into lobes. And so this thing here is the frontal lobe. This is the front of the brain. So this would sit like this, right? <laughs> OK? So this, this would sit, this is the frontal lobe. Uh, OK? This here, right behind, sort of 
right behind the frontal lobe here, okay, uh, is the parietal lobe, right? This is the parietal lobe. Back here is what is called the occipital lobe, back there, okay? And then it's hard to see here, but this thing here, okay, this is called the temporal lobe, okay? So who cares, right? Well, um, it turns out that in fact, one of the sort of guiding principles, the guiding organizational principles of the brain is that different parts of the brain do different things. So start from the back. Okay, so the occipital lobe here is actually important in vision. So if you hit yourself uh, in the back of your head, you could well become blind even though your eyes are perfectly normal. And that's because information is going from your retina to the inside of your brain, and I'll tell you about that in one second, something called the thalamus, but then it's going uh, from the thalamus to the back, an area back here called area V1, which is the main visual cortex, okay? Um, okay, the, 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 uh, the parietal lobe, the lobe right here, right, is actually a sensory lobe, so this is the part of your brain uh, where all the information about stuff that you touch uh, and um, you know the position of your limbs. And in fact, there is something called the homunculus. And uh, a homunculus is a Latin term for little man. And what that really means is that all the parts of your body are actually represented in this part of your brain. Uh, uh, and if you were to, for example, go in there with an electrode and, and uh, stimulate, it would feel to you as if you were touching something with, say, your, your toe or your, or your thumb or your lips. And the interesting thing about that representation is that, as you would expect, the parts of your body that are the most sensitive are overrepresented. So, for example, your lips occur, uh, occupy a huge amount of real estate, but uh, your, you know, your back doesn't. Right? You, don't, you don't really need to discriminate two points in your back unless you, know, you have some strange fetishes. Right? But, uh, but you, you, need, you need to figure out what you're eating. You need to figure out what it is that you're touching. Right? So, so there's this proportional representation. And right in front of it, right, there, is, uh, there is the part of your brain that controls movement. And if you take an electrode and you stimulate there, it will cause some, one, of your, one of your arms or legs, whoops, legs to move. Right? And uh, so that's, this, this is sort of motor cortex. Okay. Now, the very front, okay, is the frontal lobe, and it turns out that we don't really know what the frontal lobe does. But this is what we know. We know that it's really important for social interactions, we know it's really important for personality, and uh, a large part of what we know about the frontal lobe actually comes from people who've had uh, either accidents or have had strokes that have altered their frontal lobe. And the most famous patient, uh, you may have read about him, uh, at least some of you will have, uh, is, was a man called Phineas Gage, who uh, worked in the railroad tracks uh, in the 19th century. He uh, was using a tamping rod to uh, just put some dynamite into a hole. He was a model worker. He was the uh, head of his work crew. The thing exploded. It uh, shot the metal pole out. It went through his eye and out the top of his head. People thought that he was going to be dead, and to everybody's surprise, he just sat up and uh, sort of said, uh, what happened? And, uh, but he, you know, it had essentially eliminated his frontal, and at first people thought he was, he was fine, right? Um, and then gradually it became clear that he was not fine at all. I mean, he, he could function, he could walk, but he could no longer keep a job, he uh, got into fights, he drank a lot, uh, so kind of his moral character was somehow altered, you know? Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a problem with uh, Repul... No, say anything. Uh, it's, <laughs> just, just joking. No, 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 not, not fair. Uh, but it's a good one. Uh, okay, so one, one more thing here. Okay, I, I, I don't know if you've you noticed, but the brain is full of all these little squiggles, right? And uh, the squiggles, so there are, there are all, these, all these bits of, of, of stuff here. Now, there are two interesting things about that. Okay, the first is that there are all these, these sort of convolutions, and those convolutions are there because it turns out that we humans and primates in general have large amounts of the very outer part of the brain, which is called the cortex, which is this very outer part here. Okay, and it's easier to see, for example, in this section here, 
I hope you can see this. Okay, but it's easier to see here. Okay, so this very outer part, you, you hopefully, whoops, hopefully you can see that there is kind of a white, a sort of lighter area in the middle, right? And then there is darker stuff at the edges. That darker stuff is the cortex, and that's where most of the cell bodies are. And then the lighter stuff, there aren't very many cell bodies there. That's mostly axons that are going to you know, other parts of the brain that are sort of connecting different parts of the brain. Well, it turns out that the cortex is this gigantic sheet, but we have to fit it into you know, a head that is small enough to go through the birth canal. And so how to do that? And one approach is just to fold it a lot. So our brain has all these folds because we're trying to compress this flat sheet into a small space. Um, and now that's one thing. Now the, the second thing is that these things actually have names. So uh, in general, uh, the mountains are called uh, gyri and the little valleys, the whole, the, the kind of, these, these, these things, they're called sulci, okay? And there are a couple of important ones. Uh, there is uh, something called the central sulcus, which is here and it's in the very center of the brain and it divides the motor area from the sensory area, which is back here. This is the motor area, this is the sensory area. Right. Okay. okay, so um, so now let me just tell you, uh, let me just see how much time I have. Okay, so um, let me just, ooh. <laughs> okay, let's see how this goes. Okay, there we go, central fissure, okay. Okay, you've gone through this. Okay, so uh, with regards to, act, to, to other interesting parts of the brain. So there's another interesting feature of our brain, which is that it is actually lateralized. Now, it turns out that the brain of almost every, uh, the brain of, of all mammals is lateralized. Our, our brain is lateralized as well. This is why we are either left-handed or right-handed. It also means that different functions are in uh, different sides of your brain. So now this, as I told you before, this thing here, Right, is the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe, uh, sort of at the very edge of the temporal lobe, is a region which is very important. It's called Broca's area. And it's very important because it is the region that is important for language. And we know this because when people have strokes that damage this area, uh, they can no longer talk. And depending on exactly which part of that area is damaged, you get a different kind of speech disorder, something called an aphasia. Uh, so, for example, if you lose all of Broca's area, and I should say it's only on your left side, right, for most right-handed people. For left-handed people, uh, half of you will have it on the right side, and the rest will have some language on either side, which actually is a bit of an advantage because if you happen to have a, hopefully you won't, but if you happen to have a stroke on one side, you will have some language left. Um, okay, well, it turns out that uh, there, this, the Broca's area, which is, oh, I hate doing this. <laughs> okay, got brain juice on my pointer. Okay, so, uh, okay, so this is this is this is Broca's area right there, right? And uh, this here is uh, this 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 over here is Wernicke's area. So Wernicke's area is kind of important for meaning. So people who've got damage here actually have no problem producing sound speech. But it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and in fact, you can get interesting kinds of uh, smaller uh, strokes by, whereby, for example, you will suddenly acquire a Norwegian accent. Um, you think I'm joking, but it's true. It's not exactly Norwegian, but it sounds kind of Norwegian. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then you can get uh, damage. If you have damage sort of in between, then you'll have a sort of communication uh, kind of aphasia whereby you will be able to produce language, but you'll have trouble sort of understanding or you'll have trouble with grammar, okay? So it's actually kind of remarkable that we can localize something as complicated as speech to a specific part of the brain, right? Of course, we can localize it, but we actually don't know exactly how it is that that part of the brain does it, right? Okay, so let me just uh, talk about a few things using this, this brain here, okay? Um, so, okay, so now uh, I just want to go back uh, one last time to autism. And, uh, okay, so we have here a, a brain that uh, has been 
section sort of down the middle, down the central sulcus, right? And uh, I'm just going to point out a few, a few critical areas. Actually, well, I'll put this down here. I'll do it with my pointer. Now that it's been permanently sullied, it probably doesn't matter. OK, so there we go. OK, so, okay, so this thing here, right, I told you about this. This, this here, thing here is the cerebellum, right? And the cerebellum is, is a very mysterious part of the brain. So it's most famous for its ability to control movement. And it turns out to be really important for uh, your capacity to plan uh, specific actions. Uh, and um, in fact, there's a faculty member at Stanford who's, who's one of the, the world experts on this, uh, Jennifer Raymond. And she actually has tried to understand how it is that the neurons in the cerebellum are uh, uh, plan, uh, for example, a reaching behavior. Um, OK, so that's, that's the, the cerebellum here. And, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why it's important in one second. Uh, now, in addition to this, there's this thing here. OK? And this thing here is called the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is really important because it is this set of fibers that communicate one side of your brain to the other side. So it communicates one, uh, one, one of the hemispheres to the other hemisphere. And it turns out that there are, in fact, two sets of these. There is this corpus callosum, and then there are a couple of other pathways called the commissures. There's something called the anterior commissure that also uh, is one of the ways in which neurons from one side of the brain communicate with the other side of the brain. Okay? So remember this thing here. Now, I should just point this out. So this down here, because it's you know, very important, especially if you're, for example, say a neurosurgeon. Okay, this down here is the, uh, something called the medulla oblongata, and this thing here is called the pons. And it turns out that this part of the brain is really important for awaking, for, for uh, sort of the autonomic functions of your, of your nervous system. So your brain also controls things that you don't know anything about. So it controls, for example, your digestion, and it controls your heartbeat, and it controls your breathing. And because this thing here is at the bottom of your brain and the spinal cord would go down here, well, if you have some sort of an accident and your brain starts swelling, uh, this thing starts getting pushed out uh, the sort of bottom of your skull, something called the foramen magnum. And so what, whoops, Daisy, uh, what happened? Oh, well, that's bad. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought I had it connected. Okay, well, it's okay. We will, we will, we will continue. Uh, okay, and... Um, huh? You well, we, I have a plug, but uh, it uh, stopped being plugged. Okay, well, it's okay. We, we, will, we, will just, we will just continue. So, okay. Go ahead, you screw it up. Is it... Okay, so <laughs> it's going to be a little more harder to do this way, but we'll, we'll, we'll continue. Okay, we'll just go play here, and if it suddenly runs out of juice, try and remember carefully. I know I'm running. <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to just test your capacity to remember stuff. No. Hmm. Okay, well, I, uh, let's see how good you are at dealing with distractions. Uh, OK, so, oh, great, thank you. Wonderful. OK, good, OK, excellent. OK, so, so I'm almost done. OK, so, so this thing here, right, is, is the corpus callosum, and there's another thing called the anterior commissure. And then uh, if you have an accident, this thing might actually get herniated, which is to say it come, kind of starts uh, being pressed against the side of your skull. And because it controls your breathing, and it also controls your uh, sleeping and waking and your consciousness, uh, you will die. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why, if you have an accident, uh, the uh, neurosurgeons do everything they can to reduce the uh, swelling of your brain. Um, OK, now I just want to finish here by just telling you, by just sort of finishing, uh, by, by bringing all of this back to autism. And um, what you see here is actually an MRI of Kim Peek's brain. So you remember Kim Peek, right? I showed you the video at the very beginning of, of my lecture. and. Um, there are a couple of things that are very interesting about Kim Peek's brain. So one of them is that he has no corpus callosum. In fact, not only does he have no corpus callosum, he actually has no anterior commissure either. And he can do a remarkable trick. He can read a book, and he can read the two sides, two pages at the same time with either eye. And actually, you know, understand. 
which in itself is, is amazing, you know? So, so, you know, recently there was this report that, that, you know, people can't really multitask, but, you know, we may have a solution for this. Uh, you know, um, so, uh, so he has no corpus callosum. There's some other interesting things. He, he, this is the cerebellum here. This is a normal, a normal person. And you can see that his cerebellum is really tiny and it's really shrunken. And in fact, he has huge coordination problems and his father has to comb his hair and stuff because the cerebellum is, is really tiny. Um, there's another really interesting thing. So over here, and I didn't really tell you this, but, but tucked right there in the brain is a part of your brain called your hippocampus. And it's really small, but it's received a huge amount of attention because it turns out to be this really important uh, center for learning and memory. Now, it's not that that's where the information is stored. It's simply that somehow it's important for making this, those associations that are required for you to remember stuff. Now, check out his, his, his hippocampus, okay? So, uh, okay, not there. Okay, check out his hippocampus, okay? So he has this gigantic hippocampus, right? And, and you know, way, way bigger than the hippocampus there. You can see that it's, you know, involuted and there's almost nothing there. So, so clearly, you know, he is very good at making associations and, you know, at, at remembering stuff. Uh, this part over here, on the other hand, this is his frontal lobe. This is this part that controls, uh, you know, social interactions and all this stuff. You can see that something bad has happened, right? So you see, we can actually get some, some insight into, you know, behavior by looking at the anatomy. Now, it's not always as clean and as beautiful as it is with Tim Peek. Uh, in fact, in, for most autistic kids, the brains look more or less normal, except that they're maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so, uh, but, you know, but in this case, this kind of, you know, I think it shows you the power of, well, of trying to understand the anatomy of the brain. And of course, this is what I tell the medical students, because none of them want to learn anatomy, right? So, you know, I, I kind of tell them, well, you know, if you know the anatomy, you might be able to, you know, read somebody's mind. It could be, could be useful. So, okay, so uh, let me just finish here and uh, just, just, uh, just bring you back to uh, a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, I, I, I always finish my lectures by just thanking my lab because I showed you a whole bunch of work that we have actually done and this is a lab and so, in fact, you know, most of the time when I say uh, we, I actually mean them. So, uh, so uh, you know, without these guys, I wouldn't do anything. Uh, and then this is, this is, this is Max. Uh, and I should say, uh, just parenthetically, that you know, one uh, great thing has happened. Um, you know, you should always end on a hopeful note. And uh, which is that, you know, it turns out that, you know, of course genetics is important, but it turns out that the environment is really important too. And so, uh, you know, you know, in a sort of by, you know, taking him to a whole bunch of really intensive behavioral classes, you know, Max has gone from being, you know, pretty autistic to just being just a little bit weird. I mean, in fact, he fit right in, in many like faculty meetings. I mean, you know, he's, <laughs> So, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there is hope, you know, we, we, this plasticity of the brain, you know, you know, gives us a little bit of hope for some of these diseases. So anyway, thank you very much. I think your reaction spoke what I was feeling. This was truly a phenomenal uh, presentation, and I think uh, it covered such a broad depth of information. It's going to take you a while to, I'm sure, assimilate this, but you've been treated to a real tour de force. So, Ricardo, really thank you again. And I think it's. We're, we're just about at the wishing hour, but uh, if you're willing to take a couple of questions, we can um, do that. Yeah, have it right here. Yes, so uh, is, there, is, is there any connection between uh, immunizations and autism? And, and I would say that um, the, so 
this has been addressed extensively. Uh, in general, the answer is no. Um, let me just that's let me just give you uh, I guess what people have actually looked at and what so that uh, you know it's sort of a satisfying answer. Um, so you know the initial idea was that. Uh, uh, perhaps part of the reason for the increase in the prevalence of autism had to do with thimerosal, which is a mercury-containing compound that is added to vaccines and uh, is used as a preservative. And it, we've known for a very long time that mercury is really bad for you. Uh, and uh, in fact, this led to the phasing out of thimerosal uh, in vaccines. And thimerosal has not been in childhood vaccines for quite a while now. Um, but uh, in fact, this has made no difference in the increase in the rate of autism. So that's one reason why people don't think it's important. The second thing is that uh, the epidemiology of autism actually doesn't really go with that explanation. So when we and other people have looked at uh, who gets autism and where, it turns out that, in fact, the increase is not uniform. There are certain areas that have much higher rates of autism than others, but more or less everybody gets vaccinated. Okay? So for example, around here, there are, the rate of increase has been much higher than in other places, uh, in some areas in... Uh, you know, in, in, in Southern California, in San Diego, and in Pasadena, there are these sort of nuclei of increased uh, autism prevalence. And, uh, but, you know, most people are, get the same vaccines. It actually, one of the things it tells us is that it's very unlikely to be something that everybody uses, like plastic or something like that. The other thing that is kind of interesting is that uh, autism is a lot more common among, uh, among people of a sort of higher socioeconomic group. Um, and so it is in that way, it's actually unlike other diseases like, for example, cancer and asthma and things like that, that are sort of environmental, at least partly environmental diseases. You get them if you live next to the factory, you know? Um, so I, I would say that, you know, in general, the, the evidence suggests that no, vaccines don't, don't do it. And so. You talk about rheumatoid arthritis and what's being done to cure that. Rheumatoid arthritis. Um, well, I don't know how relevant it is. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I actually, yeah, I don't think I have much to say about rheumatoid what arthritis. Are you, what are you asking? Uh, Why are you asking the question? Uh, so it's a very different um, process and uh, it really is a disorder of joints primarily, and it's inflammatory, but not related um, to central nervous system functions. Okay. So there are two different categories of uh, things we talked. One was, you showed the Kim speech brain, where the brain itself has developed in a very <coughs> disorderly way. And other was, you showed the some cells function, where the calcium uh, flow or potential flows are. So how are these two different things related or how that happens? That's an excellent question. That's one of the things we'd like to know, right? I mean, how is it? So, so I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, I talked about two things. I talked about defects in cells. Uh, and I also talked about these neuroanatomical defects. And the question is, how is it that a defect in a cell can lead to a neuroanatomical defect? And I think the answer is that these processes that can affect, that, well, that, that are affected by some of the mutations alter the development of the brain. And so when the brain develops, uh, it, the, the precursor cells, the cells that are going to become the neurons, divide and they migrate. And if that is altered in any way, that really changes uh, the way the brain is organized. And so in a few cases, we can actually see it uh, by using imaging. So I know that uh, there are many, many more questions, and I wish we had time to do it, but it is a school night. Um, so thank you all for being here, and next week uh, we're on to genomics. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.